So we're going to talk about management by impossible objective and how Agile is really the counter to that. And people really talk about Agile being the counter to waterfall. Um, but there's like an alternative version of waterfall kind of, which is impossible objective. And so we'll talk about that. Management by impossible objective. The hypothesis is people only work if there's a deadline. And people work better if there's a crazy deadline. And part of this is driven by the notion of the procrastinator dilemma that people only work, um, that people will procrastinate until, you know, it's almost too late. And so we should manage by that by bringing the deadline in uh, so that there's a too late is earlier. Um, and probably the big hook on this, in my mind, is we never really know the scope of the work that we've asked for. And so we set a deadline that is unreasonable for the estimated work. And then the actual work is always significantly larger than the estimated. And then the deadlines look kind of goofy. Um, although people are afraid to say that. So that's management by a possible objective. People only work if there's a deadline. And Agile in a, while, a lot of ways is based on continuous flow. We're gonna create a velocity and we're just gonna continue to deliver incremental business value in a way that we can. And so these are sort of at odds with each other um, because really impossible objective is all about the end game and doesn't care what happens in the middle. So let me give you the kind of general flow for this is uh, you know, a project is described, a project vision is given, and notice I called it here project rather than product. Um, people, teams are asked for a date estimate, um, and then they're asked for a compressed schedule, the stretch goal. What would be your stretch date for this? And everybody hates giving that because if they give a stretch date, it becomes their real date. And I actually saw this even worse than that. Uh, the stretch date became the date, and then people executive leadership forgot that it was a stretch date and they gave a stretch date built on the stretch date. And then a few months into that, they actually, a lot of times you'll see the work scope will increase, but the deadline won't have changed. And so the deadline is now based on functionality we didn't scope originally, and we didn't understand the scope originally anyway. So you're gonna get how that works. And then uh, usually what happens is, uh, you know, There'll be a couple reorgs in between, but typically you'll be declared that the entire process worked, even if the project is late or doesn't have full functionality. That well, that sounded jaded. Anyway, so you know, management by impossible objective. So I'm going to give an example here. Project. I called this project by impossible. So we needed to replace a company I used to work at. Needed to replace a regulated system. The team came back with a 24 month estimate. Um, and again, we didn't really fully know the scope of it, but you know, that was the general idea. And then they were told to come up with a compressed schedule and, you know, and the team, and they were really told to come back with an 18 month schedule. And so they came back with an 18 month schedule. And then the executive leadership declared that our team, not my team, the team was better than average. And so this 18 month schedule was actually a 12 month schedule if we started right now. And so you can already see that the 24 month original estimate with incomplete information has now been compressed down to a 12 month. Um, and then what actually happened within a quarter is they added an entirely new work stream. They actually added a new set of user interface features and they kept the schedule. And what, of course, what ended up happening is the project was probably 80% complete in two years. And as you can see, uh, so the impossible objective argument is it never would have been finished without impossible objectives. Um, and the counter argument is, yeah, look, this actually took pretty much the amount of time we would have expected um, if they had people had listened to the original estimate. I also saw another one of these, uh, we we're gonna replace a, this is a different company that I don't work for. Um, replace the mainframe system, the scope project was actually scoped at 18 months for 400 people. Um, and they were all contractors. This was like utter nonsense because um, Basically, the 18 months was how long the company thought it would have a surplus that it needed to bleed off. And so they scoped it to the length of the expected surplus time. And they hired everybody on the project at once. And then at the 18 months mark, um, they declared a major milestone would happen at the 24 month mark. So the project's already run long at this point, and they've declared a major milestone. And there was a mandate that people work in the office on the weekend. And this was pre-pandemic, actually 10 years before the pandemic. And yet um, people were still knew how to work remote and the senior leadership actually would drive through the parking lot on the weekend to figure out if people were working hard enough. And that enabled people to blame the team 
uh, for the failure because they weren't working the hours that were required, although you could tell by the commits that that wasn't true. And there ended up being a series of milestones. The teams ended up losing faith in the estimates and in the reality of the estimates, right? So you set these deadlines and the business isn't intending to run in that deadline anyway. And so why are you working that hard? Um, and in this case, the project mostly probably 80% completed in about six years. So we went from, they went from 18 months to six years on this project. And a lot of that was, it was an objective based uh, project management schedule and objective. Like I set the final objective, including quote quality, the quality, the cost and the date or features and the date, and you know, those don't really work that way. Um, so really in a lot of ways, uh, you know, but like what's the big win of agile? Um, the big win of agile is you put product over project, right? Um, and that means that you're looking at what the product's supposed to do and you're not project bound. Right. The problem with the two previous examples in a lot of ways is they were project based. We set a deadline for this project. It needs to be done. Now, there are occasionally things that actually need to be done on a regulated schedule or you have a product launch or something like that. But the bulk of the work, the question is, what's the highest, most important part of that functionality? And if you work that first, do you end up achieving uh, goals you might not have otherwise? Right. Um, and so Agile really is super interesting it, as a product over project. And the other problem with these other projects, um, the two I mentioned, is they were both looking for done. This thing will be done. And the reality is there was a tail on that work that ran another four or five years on six years on both of those. And that's because uh, we're building products. We're not, the project itself will continue. Victory was declared, bonuses were issued, uh, but the product wasn't done yet. Um, and like I, like I said here, right, people want stuff done. Um, and part of the deal is executive compensation can be driven by deliverables. And those compensation, uh, for good reasons sometimes, uh, can't uh, deliver on scope. And the scope changes over time. And so the deliverable actually changes, but the compensation is still tied to the same. And part of that is to make sure people don't loosen their compensation targets, right? So that they get their bonus every time when they haven't earned it. And so there's a whole death cycle there around compensation and rating based on deliverables whose scope have actually changed. And also the business value will have changed and maybe the original deliverable two thirds through the year, you find out it's the wrong one, right? Um, really most work is a continuing stream of iterations, measurement and improvement. And that's sort of that, you know, plan, do, measure, improve, uh, you know, kind of thing. And so in this case, uh, you know, in Agile, you actually just assume it's an ongoing stream of business functionality and business value that's going to be delivered. And the notion that it's a project that ends, um, yeah, the bulk of the work may end or you may start shrinking the team, but the product is never done usually. Um, and the hard part of this, right, is, you know, everybody has to buy into product over project. And there are compensation and other reasons, you know, if you're bidding this out, to contracting companies that are only project based. Um, and so in a lot of ways, uh, this becomes pretty difficult. Um, it's definitely easier if it's a greenfield, if it's a brownfield kind of project where you're doing a migration and there's 100% functionality there, then the replacement has to be 100% functional. And so that can cause some, you know, whereas if it's greenfield, you can roll out incremental, uh, you know, incremental value, right? And you don't, because you're not uh, colliding with existing functionality as much. And so you don't have to be uh, function for function equivalent. So really, I, you know, the, the talk was really about uh, management by impossible objective and Agile's a response to that, right? And so you just need to figure out, can you move to product over project and how can your org change for the impossible uh, objective? Um, so really, you know, if you're doing this the Agile way, the same projects we talked about before, we're going to replace regulated system X, the same one. Team's going to create a backlog. The teams are going to iterate through the backlog. We're going to add additional functionality and other work streams or teams to this prod product uh, build out. And those work stream priorities will change the amount of backlog that can be worked at any given time. And if we change the size of the project, um, basically the top priority business functionality is still being worked on. If we decrease the size, teams might be removed. In that case, 
the throughput is less and the delivery, the business value um, delivery will slow down a little bit. But individual business value items at the top of it will take exactly the same amount of time they would have taken before. It's the other backlog items that were below those that would be delayed. Um, and remember, the and what we do in these in a lot of cases, if it's a brownfield, like we're replacing a regulated system, We've done about five of these now, the business value is delivered in pieces um, as those pieces are peeled off the old system. So this is sort of an unwrapping the onion or taking a big gouge out of it with like a spork, right? And we deliver business value. The, probably the hard part is, you know, you're going to get 80% of the business value with probably 20 or 30% of the effort. And then the business needs to decide what the investment rate is for the final replacement, because otherwise you end up with a bunch of 20% lying around um, and you've moved on to other business value. So there is a technical data item to this, but really the big difference is I didn't set a date for everything to be done. What we're doing is we're saying these business priorities are going to be worked in this order and we're going to continually deliver value and slice pieces off of that old system or add new functionality that would have been hard to put in that old system and then figure out ways to plug that into the old system or build new microservices around or whatever it is, right? So really, hey, I don't get a giant initial definition and a schedule initiated or declared. And then you work backwards from the date and the work to figure out how that's going to work and how many people you need. In this case, you decide how much money you want to send, what the value is. You work it in that order. And if the value proposition changes over time, you pick that up in each program increment. So I'm going to tell you that impossible objectives are often impossible. Actually, by definition, they're impossible, right? That's why we call them that. I'm going to give you a stretch goal on your stretch goal. That's impossible. And some teams can do stretch goals if they're reasonable and they're set by the team. Um, and I'm going to tell you, you know, like they're, they're going to be like, oh, we know everything we need to do. Give us a date. And I'm going to tell you they're lying. Um, that we are lying. Anybody's lying to you if they told you they know what the entire plan is at the start of the project. Run into this a bunch. What is your whole plan? It's like, here's our plan with like more and more ambiguity as we go out in time. And that should be expected. And that's why a date is virtually impossible. And people are like, well, it's because it's software. That's not true. Bridges and civil engineering projects are late a lot of the time. And that's because uh, there are changing requirements and other things that come into that and staffing and other pieces that, you know, we got 2000 year old and, you know, engineering disciplines. Uh, there's a lot more to them than before. Um, but basically pretty much any of these, if people tell you that the, they know what the project's going to look like at the end and that's how we can estimate it very rarely, especially in software, is that true? And so I would just say impossible objectives are impossible and therefore we should find another path and Agile is one of the ways we can do that. I hope that's useful. If you need something more in depth, like a justification for something you're dealing with, uh, leave a note and maybe we can do a custom one and maybe we could even do it together maybe. Have a great day.